We st oh, is that what it is? Uh, I was thinking it was still a turkey hangovers that were going on or something. But, uh, how many of you have had uh, leftovers already, at least once? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And today is the rest of the leftovers. Is that what you're saying there, Dan? And tomorrow. And, tomorrow, and for the next month or so, right? Well, let me, um, let me just lead us in a quick word of prayer before we come uh, to the, the word here this morning. And um, if uh, you want to prepare yourself, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to be. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for moving uh, in the lives of those uh, men who penned these words uh, through that concurrent operation of your power working through them and their creativity brought uh, to bear in the, the writing of these letters, of these books, of these poems. Lord, uh, you have revealed yourself to us. You have given us a better understanding of uh, who you are, what you what you want from us, what you demand as the God of the universe. And Lord, we are moved uh, to a sense of uh, awesomeness to contemplate who you are, to contemplate your knowledge, to contemplate your power, to contemplate the fact that no matter where we go, as Paul said in Romans 8, we cannot get away from the Holy Spirit, that you are there everywhere we are, and your love follows us. And Lord, we are so thankful for that. Lord, help us understand this passage as best we can this morning, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Uh, so, the question, have we missed Christ's second coming? Obviously, uh, we would all respond, uh, no, we, we haven't. But this was really a question that was on the minds of the Thessalonians when Paul writes this letter. Uh, and we know this is the second letter that Paul writes fairly soon after the first one, the first letter of 1 Thessalonians. He, he's really dealt with, with several main topics. He's talked about their uh, faithfulness. He's talked about their persecution that they're suffering. He's talked about the the confusion that many of them had about the second coming, uh, whether those who had already gone on to be uh, with the Lord had already died, whether they were missing something because they weren't still alive when Christ comes again, because they were all expecting him to come right away. And uh, then he's also talked about the importance of living life in the here and now, to not simply be uh, depending on uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ to do everything for you because you're just going to sit back and wait for God to come back. And all those were issues that were really creating a problem in the church at Thessalonica. And so Paul has dealt with those, but shortly after that, he learns that there's some of that has intensified. And uh, the persecution intensified. The tendency to still simply... Uh, you know, depend on others in the church instead of rising up to, to meet your own responsibilities by certain individuals within the church was still happening. And even this concept of the second coming, it took a slight turn, however. And it seems though there was a question that was being raised. And the question was this, have, has Christ already come? And so we're saying, yeah, he's already come. The signs are there, and we missed it. Now, I don't think that that is our problem today, that we really think we've missed it, but I do think it is our problem. Let me explain. Uh, many Christians, I think, have missed the second coming in this sense. They really don't believe it's going to happen or happen anytime soon. Um, say, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, um, we, we theoretically know it's coming. So we look at the Word of God, it seems pretty clear. But I don't know that a lot of Christians practically live as though it's coming. 
Catch where I'm going with this? There's a difference. Uh, and I can understand why, because it's been a long time since Christ ascended. It's been a long time since those promises were made. A lot of water passing under the bridge. Um, and, you know, after a while, you begin to start thinking, well, you know, it really isn't going to happen. I mean, practically, you know, theoretically, yes, it's going to happen. But in terms of how we live our lives, we don't really think of it as happening anytime soon. Because it hasn't happened till now, what makes us think it could happen tomorrow? Oh, we would like to say that. He could come back at any moment. Uh, but, uh, I mean, do we really believe that? I think if we did, it would change the way we live. <laughs> So this uh, section here, which is really uh, verses 1 through 12, is really a part of a much larger section, which is really all of chapter 2. Paul is going to deal with this issue about uh, whether the second coming has already happened. And while we have no problem with that, understanding that that's not happened yet, in the process of hearing how Paul deals with that for the Thessalonians, I think we will find some encouragement, and even some challenge to rethink our own, perhaps, perspective as we look at the second coming today, to see how close, perhaps, we really are to what is going to transpire. So uh, that's, my, that's my hope as we go through this, uh, this passage together. So let me read this first three verses for you. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. I want to stop right there. This is the problem. This, this was the issue. There were some apparently that were uh, proclaiming the fact that we have missed it. It's already happened. In fact, they were probably going even a step further and saying, Paul verifies this for us. We know this is right, which is totally contrary to what Paul was going to do. In fact, what he's going to do in this letter. And he, he identifies three modes or possible modes of how this idea is coming to the church. First, he says, either by spirit, which you'll notice is a small s. It's not a capital S. Um, and most likely what he is referring to is probably the supposed movement of the spirit in giving someone a word of knowledge or you know a, a prophetic word uh, which was common in at this particular time uh, in the church since they didn't have the completed canon of scripture like we do today uh, the other options he gives are spoken word a teaching probably referring to things that supposedly paul had taught while he was with them and people standing and saying, remember, Paul said this. I mean, I don't, I've had that happen before. I'm sure you have too. Maybe you've even been guilty of it. I, I know I probably have. Where I could, I could have swore I heard the teacher say this, when in reality that come to find out that's not what they said at all. Uh, it's easy for us to twist things or forget or try to fit them into our own categories. And then the third mode, of course, a, a letter from Paul. And Paul knows he didn't write any letter. So if there was an actual letter circulating, it was counterfeit. And someone else had signed his name to it. Now, most likely, most scholars feel this first mode, this, this word of knowledge, was probably the main culprit when it comes to the Thessalonians. Because the writing of 2 Thessalonians is so close to the, first Thess the writing of 1 Thessalonians, and that all... Both of those are so close to when Paul was actually there with them, teaching them. So when we understand that, that Paul primarily is really probably attacking that particular mode, 
but he he includes you know however you get it there is a teaching that i have given you and that's the one you need to hang on to don't let someone else come in and tell you the opposite to give you this false word of knowledge or false prophecy in fact we know that that is what paul is concerned about from verse 5 when we get there you'll see that if you have your bibles open you can just look there uh, in 5 and 6 where he actually reminds them this very thing he's talking about is something he's already taught them so this person or persons apparently either have been deceived themselves by the by the enemy by satan or they're attempting to deceive others for whatever reason personal reason so paul wants them to understand this is something they should not react to in fact the verb he uses there don't uh, you know he, he says that your your mind is um get back there i want to for some reason now i'm not he says concerning the lord jesus christ being gathered together to him don't quickly be shaken in mind that word is uh, it has the force that the tense that it's in it has the force of almost being right at the edge of panic suddenly i've realized this what and it's it's a it's a knee jerk almost a panic response and he's concerned that this is what's going on within the church so in order to counter this he's going to give us several things that have to happen before uh, the second coming of the Lord. So we read, let no one deceive you in any way, verse uh, 3, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called god little g or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of god proclaiming himself to be god now two things i I just want to make you aware of before we unpack some of this Uh, this is a difficult section of scripture to understand let's just clarify this uh, right up front and the reason for it is because we are given incomplete information by paul very cryptic and we have to ask ourselves why is that well the answer to that of course is in verses five and six because paul tells them remember this is a teaching i have given you when we were together. So all the things that Paul is going to refer to in verses one through 12 about the second coming are things that he's already talked to the Thessalonians, taught them in more detail. So he doesn't feel the need to go into a lot of detail because what he's doing here now is reminding them of this, this, these facts that he's taught them in the past because his real point of this whole second chapter in the letter is to encourage them to give them hope and that's why really we stop this morning at verse 12 because there's a lot of stuff here to look at i didn't want to take you know three hours to do it this morning because we we only have the room for two hours and then i didn't think you all wanted to stay and move to the hallway and then i'll stand around as i finish up Uh, so we're going to go through 12 but then from 13 to 18 that is really where paul focuses in on the main purpose for what he is telling them and that is to give them hope to to help them to uh, find comfort in this truth about christ's coming and we'll talk about that next week on Zoom. All right, I like the way I weave that in there, just a little extra bit. Yeah. 
All right, so the first thing you need to understand is that we're dealing with incomplete information. Paul is referring to something that he's already taught them. So he doesn't feel the need to go into all this great detail as if they have never heard it before. In fact, he depends upon them knowing, remember, this is what I said. Uh, you know, I've done that before. I do that uh, every you know class when I teach at Jessup. Uh, I'll refer to things that I've already taught the students. I don't go back and reteach those things uh, point by point because it's things that I've already taught them. So I'll just go back and refer to certain key things in order to jog their memory about, ah, oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, I remember that. We do this all the time as well. So that's part of the reason why this is difficult. Uh, the second thing, um, I want to point out to you is that Paul is actually changing perspectives as he goes through this paragraph, this uh, verses 1 through 12. He changes perspectives from uh, looking at the future to looking at the present, his present, with the Thessalonians' present time. And then he goes back to the future again. And if you don't catch this, it can become very confusing. Right? So, the first perspective from 3b, we might say, verses 3b, the second half of verse 3, uh, through to the end of verse 4, that is really moving from the present that he is speaking to the Thessalonians in and looking towards the future. When Christ comes again, here's what's got to happen. Here are the things that needs to happen. Okay, so that's a forward look. But when you get to 5 through 7, verses 5 through 7, he's talking about something that's more in the present for them uh, in terms of their understanding. And then when you get to verse 8 all the way through to 11, then he is looking back to the future again. All right, so you get this change of perspective, and you need to keep that in, in uh, the back of your mind. And that will help you a lot as we sort through some of these things. All right, so several events, Paul says, needs to uh, transpire, and he reminds them of this. Uh, and our, our struggle is going to be wanting to put our finger on the exact event, uh, you know, that he's talking about, be able to articulate it perfectly, and that is not going to be something we're going to be able to do because we just don't have the information. Um, scholars have tried to kind of put together other passages of Scripture that may be referring to what he's talking about here, and so that helps some. But even with that, we still are left with a lot of gaps. Uh, speculation abounds. The problem is, is when the speculation becomes fact, and it actually is in fact, we need to make sure speculation is fine as long as we keep it that way. It's kind of like what's happened with, you know, the um, um, theory of evolution and, and science classes across the country. They still call it the theory of evolution, but very few, uh, you know, those who teach, teach it assume that it's a theory. <laughs> They're assuming it's fact. It's obvious. Everybody knows it's fact. Um, so we want to be sure we don't make that mistake here because we really don't know the specifics. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we get to each of these events. The first one he talks about is, he calls it the rebellion. In fact, it's the, the definite article, the, is actually in the Greek text, which usually points to a specific point, a specific time, a specific event. The rebellion. This is something that Paul has taught the Thessalonians, that he has talked about. Now, he doesn't give us a whole lot of descriptors about it. He just calls it the rebellion. But he does so knowing that the Thessalonians would remember that teaching, what it was specifically that he was talking about. So we're left with trying to pull together as best we can from the information that we can glean, what this may be referring to. So uh, there are a number of passages that seem to talk about something very similar. The first comes from Matthew 24, uh, verses 3 through 14. This is a part of the Olivet Discourse, it's called. 
Uh, it's a teaching that Jesus gave to the disciples as they were asking about future events and, and what things that Jesus had said would transpire, and they wanted to know more information. Uh, so we read, uh, starting in verse 3, as he sat, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, hence the term Olivet Discourse, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the aid, end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Boy, that sounds like the evening news to some extent to me, but uh, I'm sure there are believers who have thought that for many, many years. All these are but the beginning of the birth pain. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increasing, I want you to notice that verse because lawlessness will be increasing the love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come so jesus is talking about events that unfold and he uses this statement the that lawlessness will increase, which is interesting because that's going to actually come into play in our text in just a moment. I'll point that out. First Timothy chapter four, verses one through three is a, is a place where Paul talks a little bit about this, this time. Um, he's talking to his young protege, Timothy. He says, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the uh, insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid uh, marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. In his second letter to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, he continues talking about this time. He says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will, be, uh, will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpleasable. Uh, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Interesting, just a side note, and this will not be any extra charge on the bill. Um, you'll notice he's talking not about people in the world, unbelievers, He's talking about those who claim to be followers of God. They have the appearance of godliness, but they lack the power thereof. Avoid such people, he says, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Uh, ladies, there could be weak-willed men as well in our culture today. Understand within this culture, that was more apt to be women that were victims than men. Um, but the principle still holds true for both. Um, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, uh, so these men also oppose the truth. 
men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men, the Janus and Jambres, and God dealt with them. So what comes from these three um, theological context passages that we've looked at that seem to be talking about this same time? Uh, what one thing that truly comes out is this sense of rebellion, this sense of turning from God, um, and, and not just those who already have, you know, stated, well, we don't want anything to do with God, those unbelievers in the world, but we're talking about people who are supposedly are people of God, or at least they claim to be. And um, so this may be in part what this rebellion is about. Also, scholars believe that there is a possibility because of this term that he uses for this man of lawlessness. We got a lot of men and women who are lawless. What is this man of lawlessness? Well, what is that referring to? They think this idea of lawless, lawlessness, remember I, I told you to remember that phrase that Jesus uses, um, that this rebellion may actually also be connected to a, a sense in which law as a whole, the, what holds society together, starts falling apart. People do what they want to do. They disregard those who are put into place to keep order. They disregard laws that help to keep order. They start doing in their lives whatever feels good to them, whatever is there that uh, will give them something that they want, despite what it does to anybody else. Sound familiar? And that's something that is increasing as well. So it's very possible that this rebellion is sort of a combination of those things going on that will intensify. Now, when Paul taught this to the Thessalonians, it's very possible that he gave them some very specific things that he just doesn't give them here because he's assuming they remember those things. But what we can take from this is that there is definitely a trend that is going to take place, a rebellious trend. The next thing that I would just point out is this title, this, this individual, this man of lawlessness is to be revealed. Um, let me uh, have you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. We read, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Um, we tend to think of when the Bible talks about uh, sin, that sin is a matter of uh, morality. We, we tend to put it in that camp. And, and the reality is, the Bible doesn't really look at sin solely in terms of ethical uh, morality or ethics. The Bible really focuses, when it talks about sin, upon this concept of being contrary to the will of God moving against God, uh, rejecting God. And so certainly ethical behavior or the lack thereof, morality or the lack thereof certainly would flow from that since God is the, the source of righteousness and, and goodness and justice and fairness and all those things. And so if we reject his principles, if we reject what he uh, desires for mankind, we're going to naturally be drawn towards the opposite of that. Uh, but just understand that. So this, this man of lawlessness is somebody who apparently utilizes this rebellion for his own uh, uh, devices. And the text says that he is to be revealed, which means that he's already at the time of his revealing, he's already around, he's already present. It's not somebody who just comes on the scene suddenly and everybody sees, but somebody who rises through uh, utilizing this rebellion uh, and 
uh, to his own advantage. Now, the other places in Scripture talk about such a person. Uh, Daniel 7 refers to uh, such a person that is coming. Uh, Matthew 24, back at the Olivet Discourse, starting in verse 15 through 21, Jesus talks about this person. Uh, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, of course he's referring to Daniel 7, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak and alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days uh, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a sabbath for then there will be great tribulation such as that ha has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. So it's very possible that what he is referring to, in fact, most, most uh, scholarship is going to be in agreement with this, that this man of lawlessness refers to the Antichrist that's coming, right? There's going to be an individual who represents the desires of Satan, who is controlled by Satan. In fact, we'll learn in a little while towards the end of our text here this morning that it's Satan's power at work through him. Uh, and this Antichrist, uh, this man of lawlessness, needs to come on the scene. And then the second coming can happen. So the second coming doesn't refer to the rapture. If there is a rapture, Notice how I did that. Where is he? What does he believe? Well, I'm just going to give you all the options. Um, but it refers to when Christ comes back and um, defeats Satan, defeats the Antichrist. All right? So um, <clears throat> Paul has looked now ahead and he's seen, okay, so these things have to happen. We wish you'd have given us more information about exactly what each of those things are, but what we can tell generally is there is some great rebellion spiritually, physically, that is going to occur in the lives of people as they turn further away from God. And this is going to be uh, ushering in this, this figure, this antichrist figure that is going to set himself up as being God himself uh, to, to sort of bring it all to a head. And then Christ comes back. So big swaths of, you know, being painted here in, uh, in single sentences. All right, now Paul is going to refer back to where they are, this, the present time, Thess the Thessalonians' present time. He says, do you not remember, verse 5, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Ah, yeah, but we want you to tell us all the things again, Paul. No, he doesn't. He tells us some of the things just enough to jog their memory. And you know that what is restraining him now, him being the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, uh, so that he may be revealed in his time. There it is. He, he's present or he will be present before the revelation of who he is, uh, before he's revealed. Uh, verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Notice this. I mean, Paul is pointing out the fact that even in the Thessalonians' day, this, this tendency towards rebellion was already working, and it's going to be something that will continue to grow and to grow until it reaches a climax, a, a zenith. You know, that's the rebellion, uh, and that will prompt the coming uh, of Christ. And he says, only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Now, I want you to notice, notice in verse 5, um, well, I'm sorry, in verse 6, and you know what is restraining him. Impersonal pronoun. 
But when you get to the last part of verse 7, it reads, only he who now restrains. Personal pronoun. What is it, Paul? Is it a thing or is it a person? Well, this actually has led most scholars to realize that it's probably both, and it probably is a reference, this rebellion and the man of lawlessness, it's a reference to uh, the law as a whole that keeps society ordered, and certainly God, uh, God's um, law um, reflected in that, to keep society running smoothly, but also the representatives of that law, the individuals uh, that uh, would represent that. And so it's very possible what Paul is saying here, he's kind of using both, he's kind of mixing his pronouns, uh, calling it a thing, but also calling it uh, a person as well. It's confusing, but that seems to make the most sense when you look at the, the linguistics involved. So that leads us to this question about restraining. What is it exactly? Who is it exactly? What are we talking about here? What's restraining? Well, one of the, one of the theories that has been promoted um, within a certain uh, segment of scholarship has been that this, this must be talking about the church and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the church would be the what, and the, the he is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that seems to make a lot of sense, especially if you are pre-trib. Uh, it, it really points towards that kind of idea, because if the church is raptured at the beginning of the tribulation, then that presence is no longer there as a final sort of restraining process that's going on. But the, the problem with that is that, does that that doesn't necessarily mean that the Holy Spirit is not present anymore. People will still come to the Lord, we are told through the book of Revelations, during the tribulation time. So does that mean they don't receive the Holy Spirit because they weren't in that little church age? That doesn't quite follow. So. That has led uh, the majority of scholarship to think eh, it probably is not the church per se, at least not in Paul's mind. Uh, but this restraining aspect that's going on and the people that represent it, it fits better to look at it in terms of what now, what in Paul's day, what all through history has allowed society to maintain some cohesiveness. And that's the rule of law. It's the, it's the um, openness to the truth that God represents. It doesn't necessarily mean that every society believes in God, but the principles that are godly are present in many other societies that don't even follow uh, the teaching of the Bible. Because of that, influence there is a restraining process taking place but at some point that's going to be removed and at that point the rebellion becomes clear and the man of lawlessness becomes uh, clear and then shortly thereafter christ comes back now, I would like to give you more details about what exactly is going to happen. I can give you theories, but Paul doesn't really give us any more details than that in the text. He's just, because his point is not to teach again about the second coming, but it's to give remembrance to teaching that has already happened so that they are encouraged and their hope is increased. So now he's going to look forward again in verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill, we like that, with the breath of his mouth, which doesn't mean he's got bad breath. Now, some people can kill with their breath. Uh, that's not the point. This is all very, um, there, there are very, uh, a lot of elements of uh, apocalyptic literature in this paragraph that Paul picks up. 
with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a a number of things here we just need to make sure that you understand that can be somewhat uh, uh, troublesome for us. Um, For one thing, um, we understand that the the Antichrist, when he comes, uh, he's going to be performing signs and wonders. He's... um, He's going to be exercising the power of Satan in uh, his attempt to fool, to deceive the world that has already thrown off every encumbrance of law, uh, encumbrance of decency, encumbrance that would flow from the the truth of God uh, and his justice and righteousness. And now it's all been about self. And he's he's going to do things that will draw them in so that they follow him. Uh, and they uh, give their full allegiance there, uh, Paul says. We can see that. We can, we can understand that. But, and we can understand that Jesus is going to get rid of this guy. He's going to take him out. That's great. What we don't understand is how is it that God, in his righteousness and justice, is involved in deluding these people. Because you'll you'll notice, he says, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned. What? 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 God is making this happen? What is going on here? Well, one thing you need to understand is that in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, the writers of Scripture always have a fairly high view of the sovereignty of God. Okay? And so much so that in their minds, nothing happens unless God allows it to happen. So God is never like the God of Hollywood. This has always been my pet peeve. The God of Hollywood is sort of on equal par with evil. And that's where you get the tension going back and forth. And that makes for a great story. Uh, But it's not truth. The Bible makes it clear that God is sovereign. What that means is that if he wills something to happen, it will happen. There is nothing that will thwart his will unless he is giving his permissive will, which is a form of sovereignty as well. God doesn't want us to sin, but he allows us to make that choice for his purposes to teach us, to bring us to a place uh, where he is he's working us and moving us towards a Christ likeness. And that's a discussion, a whole long discussion for another time. But that's his permissive will. But he is still in control of that. So nothing's going to happen unless God says, I'll allow that to happen. That's different than saying God makes things happen. But to the writers of Scripture, they so want to maintain the the awesome power and sovereignty of God that you will find statements like that that are very, if you're not careful, they will tend to confuse you thinking what the author is actually saying is he has caused the evil. He has caused the, the, the deceit. He has caused this. He's sending the lies to them, this delusion, sending them this strong delusion so that they'll believe something that they really don't want to believe, but they have no choice. They have to believe it. 
and then they're going to be condemned and he'll be saying, yeah, I got you. But that's not the way God works. We know that from other aspects of scripture. But in the way Paul states it, it gives you that impression that that's what God's doing. But in reality, what really he is saying is this, that their desire to gratify self and to follow the Antichrist, to be deceived by the Antichrist's lies, is so great, their rebellion is so great against God, that at some point he steps back and allows them to have what they want, the choice they want. He is in control. He could stop it. He could say, you know, turn them into robots, change them, and they don't have to do anything. But of course, that violates free will. And so at some point, God steps back and says, okay, let it happen. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Revelation chapter 19, uh, verses 11 through 16. Uh, we see one of the visions that John the Apostle had. He says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and his head are like uh, on his head are many diadems, crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. I've often wondered, what is that name, I wonder? Only he knows. But how does John know that name is on his head? See, this is part of the, the beauty of apocalyptic literature. It's very fanciful. It's kind of like almost reading like a Tolkien novel you know, with all the fantasy stuff like that. But it does communicate something, that there are depths of Christ, of God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, that we will never be able to probe and understand or know. And he says, verse 13, He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Well, that gives it away, doesn't it? Just read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. You'll understand who that's talking about. Uh, and the armies of heaven are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. We're following him on white horses. I don't know about you, but an army dressed in pure white linens and that's it? Seems like a really ill-equipped army, doesn't it? You're going to get dirty really fast. But there's a reason for that, because it has nothing to do with them fighting a battle. The battle, actually, that's already been fought, is, uh, the, that they're going to fight is one that's already been fought and won. The only one who's going to do the fighting is who? Jesus. So they don't have to have armor. They don't have to worry about it getting all bloody or torn up or uh, dirty. Um, so they are there with him, white and pure. We're following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Kind of reminds you the breath. He will kill the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Uh, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe. And on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This, of course, is John's vision of this coming event, the second coming of Christ. And it's clear that when he comes, nobody's going to miss it. And all of this has been Paul reminding them of a teaching that obviously was much more detailed when he did it, but that they have already have in the back of their heads. They should remember. They should choose to respond to in how they live, how they think. But apparently they have forgotten some of that. They have forgotten their need to rehearse some of these facts that he has them. 
And so Paul simply reminds them in a cursory fashion about what must take place. And the reason for this is so that they might be encouraged. That they might have hope. Now we're going to talk more about this uh, on Sunday. But I just want to leave you with this thought. As we went through verses 1 through 12, I don't know if you caught this. It certainly was apparent to me as I was studying this is um, there are so many so many things that are happening today that fit what are what are there in verses 1 through 12 that are referenced to in a cursory fashion. Does that mean we're about ready to enter into the end times or we're in the end times? It's possible. Does it mean the end times might still be like 50, 100 years away? It's possible. Don't really know. But there's one thing that it should do, and that is remind us of, wow, we're moving towards that inevitable end. Jesus is coming back. And just because it has been so long since when he first made that promise to today, don't let that fool you into thinking that it really practically isn't going to happen anytime soon. We don't know. What we do know is that keeping before our thinking this truth, that he's coming back, it's imminent, and we see signs around. Jesus called it, you know, knowing the seasons. All of that should remind us to always keep our eyes looking up because that will change how we live our lives, how we think about events that happen in the world, how we maneuver in this life. Instead of thinking that our best life, to borrow Oprah Winfrey's phrase, our best life is what we can make it in this day and time. We as believers should be thinking, our best life is yet to come. That's going to happen in eternity. And how we live today is an opportunity for us to increase that anticipation and to bring glory to God in the process as we become more like Christ. I can't give you specific details, which I know would make it even easier for you to make that choice, to focus on the second coming as being as real as it could happen any moment. Uh, but that's something that you and the Holy Spirit need to work through. But I challenge you, make yourself open to it. Uh, let the Spirit of God energize your imaginations as you reflect over the facts that we do know from Scripture. Amen? Father, we do pray that you would help us to be aware of the truth of your word, and especially as it speaks to your coming again, Lord Jesus. It's so easy for us to theoretically believe in your second coming, but not practically live our lives as if it could happen at any moment and in something that we're looking forward to. Lord, it's true that there might be many of us here that that pass away from this uh, existence and go to be with you in your presence uh, long before you come back. And it's also very true that there might be those of us here that are present when you come back. We don't know. Our focus, Lord, we don't want it to be on trying to determine that. We want our focus to be on the fact that it will happen and live our lives accordingly. And so it's to that that we ask for your grace at work in our lives. And we pray this in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.